Hello, this is a, a screencast of uh, the remainder of the lecture. We'll see how it goes. Uh, I'll pick up somewhere around where we left. Uh, let's make this first uh, full screen. Oh, that's half screen. Back to full screen. Uh, you should be able to follow along. Uh, so this was the trunk function we talked about, which deals with stripping the decimal. It's uh, straightforward to use trunk and then uh, the round brackets. So trunk of 9.75 and a trunk of minus 9.75, what you get is 9 and minus 9. Now this was perhaps not viewable in class, but here you have an overview of all the mathematical functions. So I explained to you log, uh, log x, log to the base e, and that was a 2.71, uh, which you saw in earlier slides. You also have exponential of, uh, of uh, x, so that's known as the antilog of x, so e to the power x. So uh, that's what uh, the number 2.718, etc., as, as, as the base. So you don't have to know all these types of functions, but it's good for you to recall. Most commonly, you would be interested in uh, log and uh, log 10. You would also be interested perhaps in the square root of, uh, of a variable. But you also have uh, uh, functions which you might remember from high school, like sine, cosine, and tangent. Uh, and perhaps also quite useful is that the absolute, so the absolute value of, uh, of x. So this is just here for your reference in case you have to look up those mathematical functions. Now, perhaps there was some confusion about the notation of uh, larger numbers. So 1.3 E3 means 1300 because it basically means move the decimal point, uh, point three places to the right. So that's how you get 1300. So here, this is where the point would be. And so we've moved it uh, three places to the right, and then you get 1300. So 1.5 E minus 2 means 0 0.015 because the E2 indicates move the decimal point two places to the left. So again, you can sort of see if we shift that point to put our place to the left, we get 0 0.015. It's just a notation to save the space when we're using R. And then uh, you're probably all bamboozled by this, but for those of you at complex advanced maths, uh, R can also deal with complex numbers. So in a complex number, you have a real, no a real part, so that's the 3.6, and you have an imaginary part. And the imaginary part is, uh, is uh, involve the number uh, i, and i is the square root of minus 1, and that is imaginary because it doesn't exist. But sometimes you might still want to calculate with imaginary numbers, and that's uh, why uh, why you, you would need it. But it's mostly there for your reference. Now, we reach this part, and then we sort of uh, end it, but uh, let's, uh, let's continue a little bit. So let's make a variable. We often uh, want to store things on which we'll do the calculations later on. So my age, we would make a variable Thomas dash uh, and, uh, and, uh, underscore dash age 35, and that would then be a variable which is stored in the environment uh, with uh, that age value. So important, the variable names in R are case sensitive, so Thomas with a capital is not the same as Thomas. Variable names should not begin with numbers, so e.g. Uh, two Thomas age or symbols, so avoid uh, percentage or avoid dollar signs because they have special meanings in code, so try not to use those. And variable names should not have any blank spaces, so use body weight with, a, with an underscore rather, or body dot weight rather than body weight. So you can now make a, a variable, so you should try and make a variable. Uh, if you're uh, doing this together, uh, you could do it for one pair in, uh, of you, but try to make a variable with your age. I have to stop here. And now Somebody else is knocking on my door. Sorry for that. So in terms of terminology, there is, uh, this is mostly for your reference, but programming comes with uh, different, uh, different terminologies in different languages. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about object modes and object classes. I don't know what half of those words mean. At this point, I'm afraid to ask. And basically, it's just labeling things, which uh, you might also uh, use later on with Chris uh, McCarthy's class in, uh, in Python. So we use integer when we want to refer to whole numbers, so 15, 23, 8, 42, 4, 16, those are all integers. Sometimes we have uh, real numbers, so we have decimals, and then that's not an integer anymore, and we have 3.14, 0.002, uh, 
and we remember the E notation. I've put it a capital E, but uh, it's the same uh, same principle. We also have in uh, in R uh, text strings. So occasionally you might not have a, a number, but you might want to refer to something uh, as a, a text. And so you would have hello world, ruffle myo, and uh, Dr. Pollitt. And so those would be examples of text strings. We can also have logical uh, logical modes, so something which is true or false. So we can ask the computer whether something is higher or lower than a different number, and then we can get a response whether it's true or false. And it's abbreviated as T, uh, T or F in computing language. Now in terms of object classes, so mode is basically about uh, uh, some aspects of it. And most of uh, the things uh, are, again, mostly for your reference. So we have vectors, and vectors are objects with an atomic mode. We have factors, and so this, uh, these are vector objects with discrete groups. So if we can have, for example, uh, something going from uh, uh, small to, uh, to large with different uh, discrete groups, and they can be ordered or unordered. So you might also have categories of people, so you might have male or female, and you could order that as a factor. Again, these are terms for terminology. You might be working with a matrix. So a matrix con uh, is, consists of rows and columns. It's a two-dimensional uh, array, but arrows can have uh, multiple uh, dimensions. So you can think of it as a matrix with several, several uh, dimensions rather than just two. So it's basically, if you want to store uh, uh, data, sometimes you might want to store them in arrays. And then we have a list, so lists are quite special as well, and they're, uh, they're vectors of components. Again, most of this is just terminology, don't worry too much about it, because the key thing you care about are uh, data frames. So they are like your SPSS data sets, they are matrix-like, so you have the list of variables usually, and then you have uh, some rows, and this is the one you care most about, and this is one about which I'll do most of my teaching, but you should know that vectors, factors, matrices, arrays, and lists exist. And often when you encounter errors, it's because you are feeding R a, a, a matrix and it's expecting a data frame, or you're feeding R an array and it's expecting a list. So that's where most of the, uh, of the issues come from. You, uh, you're trying to uh, get something in a different type of class. But all of that will be, uh, become clearer as we go along. Now, uh, assignment, not the actual assignment which you'll do, but or how to label a vector or a variable. So we had this example and you uh, recall the arrow, so the arrow is used to assign. And uh, at your own risk, you could also use is, so if you write Thomas underscore H is 35, that would also uh, give you uh, a variable with 35, but in, uh, in convention, you would use the, uh, the arrow. And there's good reasons why, which you can read uh, here if you click the link. Now suppose we want to combine things, then we use C and the round brackets to combine uh, to combine different uh, things, uh, different things into like a larger vector. And I'll give you some examples later on. So C stands for combine or concatenate. Sec uh, sec x means to generate a sequence. So you can ask R to generate sequences of things, for example, of numbers. The square brackets denote the position of an element, so they're different to the round brackets. So they tell you where something is in the list, and we'll run through some examples in a bit. And here now are some examples. So let's make a, a sequence. So we have sequence one, and then uh, double points five. And so this will print a sequence of just numbers going from one through five. So you can try that on your own uh, console. Now you remember that we had my age. We can also make a variable for my uh, height, which is in centimeters. So we have Thomas underscore height. And on an optimistic day, I'm 188.5 uh, centimeters. And if we ask Arden uh, to print that value, it will print it if we just print the variable name. So if you would have done Thomas H, you would have hopefully gotten 35. Now we can make a, a combined factor. So for example, of how many coffees I drink in a week. So we have uh, seven elements in that factor. So I have one coffee on Monday, two on Tuesday, zero on Wednesday, zero on, uh, on Thursday, one on Friday, four on Saturday, and five on Sunday. And that would be represented in this way. So that's the C combines all the uh, things into a vector. And then if we ask R to print it, it will print all the elements which uh, are listed there. 
Now we can ask our how many elements there are in, uh, in this uh, vector, and that should be uh, seven. And lo and behold, we find that our prints seven. So onwards, we can make a vector for, uh, for days of the week. Uh, so we, vectors are not restricted to just numbers. So I've made one with abbreviations. So if we have one, uh, uh, one called days, and we put information in there on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and we ask R to print it, this is what it will print. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So it's done what we wanted. Now we can, uh, using the square brackets, we can ask it to print a specific element. So using the square brackets, we get uh, a specific element. So if we wanted the fifth element, that would be Friday, and R will print Friday. Now, we can also ask you to print several elements, but we uh, want to uh, combine them, so we could uh, we then use C. So if we do this, so days, square brackets, C, and then one, two, three, uh, with uh, commas, we find that it will print Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Now, replacing things, we might want to, uh, and you might recall that Friday was written in full, so we might want to replace that with fry. And so what we just do here is we take the fifth element and we assign it a new value. And if we then print it, lo and behold, R has replaced Friday with fry. Now, we can also ask it to uh, replace multiple things. So here's an example of doing that. So suppose that we want to replace Saturday and Sunday with party time. We can use the rep command to repeat things a number of times, so party time will be repeated to twice. And if we do this, then we find that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday are still printed in abbreviation, but now we have party time as elements six and seven. And you will find that it will print on, uh, as it runs out of space, it will print on, on a new line. So I would like you to try it yourself. So take some time in duos, uh, use hashtag to annotate your code, Make an atomic vector with your height, ideally in centimeters. If you don't know your uh, metric height, you can guess. Make a vector for the month of the year, and then I would like you to print the sixth and the ninth month of the year. So you, your vector should have 12 uh, elements, and I would like you to print the sixth and the ninth element. And then I would like you to replace in that vector July and August with vacation or uh, something reminding you that it's vacation. Call it summer, which doesn't really exist. So, after you've done that, uh, hopefully that will have worked for you. You can just flip back through the slides in case you've forgotten how to uh, find where elements uh, are and how you call elements and how you replace them. But uh, it should be fairly straightforward for you to do. So I, I hope you complete that exercise. So let's now move on to uh, special values. So null is quite uh, special. So it's an object of zero length and you can test it with is.null x. So it's usually sometimes we want an empty container or we want something which is empty for R to put values into, and that's a null object. So that's uh, uh, something uh, which uh, you might come across. And A means not available. It's a, it's a missing value, so it's different than a null value. So a null value is something which has some type of element, uh, and you can write something in it, but that's different from a, uh, something which is a missing value. And you can test it with is.na and then X. You can also ask if it's uh, if something is a, is a number or not. And so you should recall that some things are not uh, numbers from math, so you can't divide uh, in, uh, via zero, so you can't divide something by zero. And you can also cannot uh, use uh, take the log of a, of a negative number. And so that's, uh, that's the type of response you would get in that case. So in this case, it's not missing, but it's not a number. You also have infinity, so extremely uh, large cases, so infinity and minus infinity, and you can test with test with uh, is infinite. So if you can divide one via zero, and then you would uh, get uh, get infinite measures. So this also points us to some other commands, which is is dot numeric, etc. So we can ask R is uh, Thomas H is it numeric? Is it a number? And R tells us true because you recall it should be 35. We can ask uh, whether the dates are numeric, and then our correct response that they are false. So they're, because recall those were strings, so those were elements listed. 
we can ask R whether it's uh, atomic. And R will say that Thomas H is atomic. Then again, we can ask R if, uh, if one element of, uh, of this is a character. And R responds that it is true because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's Mon for Monday, and which, is a character, uh, which is a character type of uh, uh, category. OK, so hopefully that will be uh, clear. So you can check what type of uh, objects uh, things are in R by asking it, by saying is dot numeric, is dot character, or is dot atomic. But most often you want to check if there are missings, and that's where we use is dot na. So is dot na Thomas H? That should be false because, uh, as you recall, you defined it, so it should be 35, and hence it's uh, missing. Are there any missings in days? It will print it for all the elements and say there is no missings for, uh, for all those uh, cases. Now, often we have uh, uh, so we have vectors and we want to combine them into a matrix, and this would be the next step of building a data frame. So combining vectors is actually yeah, easy. So we can use uh, C, C vector, C vector two, and combining ve column vectors into a matrix goes as follows: we use C bind for binding them as columns. I use R bind for binding them as, as rows. So combining things into vectors is quite easy. You can make longer vector that way, but that's not a matrix. And if we want to make a matrix, we use C bind or R bind. So if we take an example with, uh, with the coffee data, so we uh, we can C bind the number of coffees a week, which is uh, a vector, and the days. And then we can ask R what it looks like. And this is sort of what it looks like. So it has seven uh, seven rows and two columns. So it has number of coffees a week as the first column and days as the second column uh, with a replacement, as you recall, for party time. And so that's what it will look like. You can also print, uh, you can also look at it in uh, RStudio itself, but sometimes you can just ask R to print what is in there. Now, that's a matrix, but a matrix is not a data frame. So in order to turn it into a data frame, we, uh, we just put as.data.frame and then it will be a data frame. So is dot data frame is the logical command to then check if something is a data frame. And lo and behold, it is a data frame after we turn it into a data frame. So why do we need uh, data frames? Data frames carry more information on matrices, and most uh, statistical packages will work with data frames, but not with matrices. Occasionally, some, uh, some packages will work with matrices and not data frames. And you'll run into those type of errors, and then you will have to use as dot data frame or as dot matrix to uh, convert them. So try it yourself. Together with your partner, or if you're alone, uh, make uh, make two vectors with your heights. Remember the order, or you can make a new one. Uh, make a vector with your ages in the same order as one. So if you're a duo, make sure it's the same order. So if uh, if person A goes first in the heights, person A should also go first in the ages vector. And then I would like you to make a data frame called that team using C binds, and you would like to uh, we would like that to be a data frame, and you would like to check that it's a data frame. So using the previous slides, try and make uh, this type of data frame. You can also make a matrix from scratch. So I presume you've taken some time to uh, to uh, to just test this. So pause the recording, have a go, and hopefully you will have made a team data frame. So you can also make a matrix from scratch. That could occasionally be handy. So NR is for uh, for the number of rows. NC is for the number of columns. In this very simple example, we just have matrix data is five, NR is two, and C is two. And that will give you a, uh, a data fr uh, frame that looks like this. So normally you would have assigned it and given it a name, but we're not going to use this. So that's why there's no arrow and no assignment. So hopefully that's clear on how you make a, a matrix. We can also uh, do it like this uh, to make a, a, we don't even need the uh, the NR or the N call. So the first uh, the first number here that's the number of rows and this is the number of columns. And here we have what it looks like. So two rows. Four columns, and R will just uh, position it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and that's the sequence. 
if you want to turn it into a data frame, you would ask as dot data frame matrix one uh, one double point eight two four, and then you could see that you can't see it entirely. But what happens now is that the, here here are labels. So you have v one, v two, v three, v four. If you don't put in any names, R will automatically make this variable one, variable two, variable three, variable four. And now you also have row numbers, whereas R here just prints uh, some notation of the elements in the matrix. And we need column names and occasionally row names to work with in our analyses. Okay. Now, one thing which is uh, quite important is uh, setting a work directory. Perhaps we should have done it earlier, but most of the time you would do this at the start of your session. And this is where you would read and write your data. So this is where all your output ends up, and this is also where you read all your output from. So this is just an example. Don't be uh, too bamboozled. So this set wd is the, uh, the set working directory command. And the tilde just abbreviates all the bits before. So most of you would actually uh, write it in full, perhaps, because you would be at somewhere like your C drive, and it would be C, double point, and then forward uh, slash. So don't use the backward slash, because that's, uh, that's uh, specific for something else. And in Linux, you would probably have a user type of uh, thing, and then Thomas, and then my directory. So the tilde just abbreviates it, and as you can see, this will end up in my Dropbox. Uh, teaching in REST Lecture 1. And that's where all the data will be and also where I can write data. So writing away data, that's the next step. So suppose you've made a matrix and now uh, you store that as a data frame and you want to save it in some type of format which you can then later read. I'm going to teach you about the most important uh, and more uh, first, most versatile format which is a comma separated value file which is abbreviated as .csv. And this is something which is read into uh, all sorts of things uh, like Open Office, uh, uh, Excel. Many, many uh, uh, programs will take comma separated variable files and be able to read them. So it's readable in uh, Microsoft Excel, which you might be more familiar with. And this is how we do it. So we use uh, write.cv and then coffee data, which you might remember. And we have to say where the, where the file, what, uh, what we want to call the file. So we just use the single uh, uh, quotation marks for coffee data .csv. Now this uh, uh, this will have row names, and we might not be interested in having row names. And then we just add command, which is row dot names is false. For any type of command, you can use uh, type in your uh, bottom console bit uh, two question marks, and then the command you're interested in to find out more. So uh, Let's see if I can just give you an example, perhaps. So if we go here, loading R Studio. Lots of things already in here. Ignore those, they're automatically loaded. So the console bit is the bit here. Uh, bit here. You'll also have an R markdown bit, but if I type question, question mark, ggplot2. You can see that R is thinking. And it will take me to the information on, uh, it could find on ggplot2. It, it has some vignettes here, and so then I can look at those help pages and find out additional information about the command I want. And so this is ggplot2, ggplot, and I could have a look at that and there's information here about what the command looks like, uh, what the steps are, what the arguments are you need, and so and it has a sample command and steps it needs. And so most of the time you also have very useful examples to then work through, and you could copy and paste those in the uh, in the console to see what they look like. So that's just if you need any type of help, so you can uh, use the help browser, but you can also use question mark, question mark, and then the name of the package. Well, back to the presentation. So some of you might in, be interested in uh, saving SPSS files. And uh, in order to do that, we need a, a package called, uh, called Haven. Uh, and it's important to also note the different notation between write.csv 
and, uh, and the haven package in how things are stored. So I've already installed haven, so I can just use require haven or uh, library haven to load the package. So just again, a reminder of how you install a package. We can go here, click install. It has a handy how to complete function. I'll just reinstall Haven. I don't want it like that. Like this. I click install. You could see it uh, clicks install of the packages, and most of the time this will go OK and it will say the downloaded binary packages are in. So I can click here, I can write library Haven. And then the package will have been uh, loaded. Alternatively, I can, so you can see that it's loaded here actually via tick mark. Alternatively, I can click or unclick the Haven package. And you can see it actually prints the command uh, here. So you can also do that in your scripts, and we'll uh, return to that uh, later. So in your R script, you would uh, install Haven and then use that. So we want to, uh, Haven is a package which deals with SPSS data and also SAS data. And uh, if we do require Haven, it will load uh, the package Haven. And then the command here is write underscore SAS, so not dot, and then coffee data. And here we don't have to specify uh, uh, the file, we just put in quotation marks coffee data dot SAS, so SPSS files end in dot SAS, as you might recall. And then it will store that uh, data file in your working directory. So just to show you that this is actually what it does. If I go to my Dropbox and I go to Teaching Nordumbia, Lecture 1, if you've gone through the steps, it will have added an SPSS file, which is coffee.data.saf. And that's uh, uh, the CSV file. You can open the CSV file via Excel. That's what it should look like. I don't have SPSS on this computer, so I can't show you what it looks like, but trust me, it will open as an SPSS file. Okay, so now we've learned how to uh, write away data. I would like you to try it for yourself. So write away your uh, your data files, the team data files, which are made as .csv and as .saf your working directory, so set the working directory first, and then I would like you to try and open your data files with Excel and SPSS if you have it. And you, I would like you to also try and find out more about the uh, write the SPSS function by using the, uh, the two question marks. Okay, I suppose that wouldn't have not been too much of a problem. And I'll move on. You can pause the recording. And I'll move on to uh, the next step, which is reading in your data. So often you will have a colleague who will have data in Excel, or you will have a, a questionnaire, which is uh, stored in, uh, uh, in Excel or in SPSS, and you want to read in the data. If it's in the same fol uh, uh, folder, it's quite easy. And I've reloaded the Haven package here. So I've typed require Haven. That's not necessarily always uh, necessary, but I've just done it here for safety. And so if I, uh, this is what the data is going to be called. So it's called coffee data, the return. And I use the read uh, underscore SAF command to, uh, to read in the data. And it's, you use the same notation with set working directory to get to the path. So you could actually put the tilde and the entire uh, name of the path before that. But it's easiest if you just uh, set the working directory and store your data in the working directory and then read it from there. So if you haven't altered the working directory, this should just work. Now the nice thing is we can even get data from public web, uh, web links. Here's some data in uh, dot dat format, and uh, we also show here the head command, which shows you the first lines of the data. So for that to work, we need a data table. So you need to install dot uh, package and use uh, install data table. But once you have that, that will read dot dat format. Here it's loading, and then we can use a command my dat. Uh, we can assign that, and we use fread, and this will read this uh, data from this web link. 
And if you just hit my dot, it will print the first uh, bits. Now that wasn't very readable, so let's see if I can do this and show it to you. So we're going to our studio. I already have a data table installed. I'm just going to click here so it's uh, so it's uh, loaded. I'm just going to copy and paste the commands here. And you can see it's downloaded the data from this website and it's printed the first six, uh, six lines for V1, V2, V3, V4, V5. Okay, so you can get data also from online uh, resources. Now, let's move on to some very basic data analyses and manipulations. And here we largely follow Wickham and Grolemund's uh, uh, excellent book, uh, which uh, I'll reference at the end, and which you should also be able to get from the library. Or even better, it's uh, available entirely for free online, and you can work through that. So you can use library to call packages, but you can also use uh, require, and you will see me alternate. Require tries to load the library, library actually loads it. There's lots of uh, debate, but I actually will alternate between both. Now I would like you to uh, 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 to install those packages. So install NYC flights 13 and tidyverse. So by now you should be able to install packages. So you can put tidyverse. We can put in a, a space and also get NYC flights going. We can click install here and it will have installed both. This is sort of what you should have gotten. Okay. After you've done that, you can use the library command to call the packages. So that's what I've done done here. So loading tidyverse, tibble, lots of different packages. Now, some of you will have gotten conflicts. It will read conflicts with tidy packages. And this is quite a common uh, issue. So often what you will find is that different packages use the same naming for the same type of command. And so many of the errors you run into have to do with conflicts. So take careful note of the conflicts message printed uh, when loading tidyverse. So So here it says, conflicts with uh, tidy packages between filter, first, lack, last, transpose. And so what it means is that these type of commands overlap between different packages. So if we have data table, data table uses a command in between, but so does dplyr. So the solution to this is that you would use dplyr between, if we want to use dplyr, and if we want to use data table, we use data dot table, and then we use between. So part of the conflicts and the issues you'll have with your code not working is because different packages are using the same commands, and you can resolve that quite easily via using the direct call of the package and telling it to use that. So if you run into problems, that's usually one of the things to check. So it tells you that dplyr conflicts with some functions. In our case, we looked at an example of data table. And some of these might even be from uh, from base R. So from without loading any package, there might be a problem. So if you want to use the base version of these functions after loading dplyr, you'll need to use their full names. And the base, uh, so base R uses stats. And so we use the, the double double points say filter and lack if one those functions and if one dplyr we replace stats with dplyr if you want dplyr to use that uh, function so waka waka fixer conflicts now what we've done is we've uh, we've uh, uh, downloaded a package which has all flights going from uh, uh, from New York City this data frame contains 330,000 flights that depart from New York City in 2013. So big data, just to show you some of the capacities which R has. The data are from the US 
Bureau of Transport Statistics and is documented in uh, flights, so you can read more about it there. And we can actually uh, call it that way. And then you can see if we do this type of command, I'll again make you believe that it works. This is the type of output you get. So we'll have printed the first uh, 10 lines of those 330,000. Uh, uh, 336,000 flights and you can see here that it's a, a tibble and what is that? So tibbles, tibbles are like data frames but with some tweaks to make life a little bit easier. So you can turn a data frame into a tibble with as tibble with this type of command. Look at the underscore and tibbles have some additional information. So if we go back, you'll find that some things are labeled as int for integers, dbl for doubles or real numbers, chr for character vectors or strings, dttm for date time format, and uh, we can go back and have a look. So we can see here that departure time is an integer, scheduled departure time is an integer, this is a double, this is an integer. And so you could see that there is 19 rows, uh, 19 columns, sorry, and 336,000 uh, 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 lines of data. So quite a lot. Okay, so this, this is the NYC flights data. So suppose you want to see everything. We can use the view command if you want to see all of the all of the data. perhaps work. Nope. We need to capitalize it. And this is wrong also because we've only put in flights and we've not attached it. So we need to call it like this and now we can view it here have the full uh, shebang out here so it's shown as the first 30 uh, first uh, first 31 rows this is uh, the data uh, uh, thing uh, the data viewing window we can sort things by easily uh, clicking on them so if we do this it will sort it, but they're all from 2013, so that's why you have no changes here. Now, if you do this, it will sort it. So 12, 1. We can look at all the uh, all the uh, all the variables here. And in case you didn't believe me, it takes some time to render. This is uh, row 335,460. And it's a flight which departed on the 30th of uh, December. Okay, so you can always look at data in, uh, in this. I'll just close it for now. You can see here that I have lots of data frames uh, open. And later on, if I just wanted to look at them, I can click on them and see the data here. So because the previous workspace was loaded, you see all my previous uh, data, and you also see some values stored. And if I want to view them, I can uh, click and look at some uh, some data. Okay. But you can also use the view command. So, so if you had attached the package, it would have uh, done flights, but because I didn't uh, label it, that's why I didn't print uh, flights. So some basics for dplyr, which is a data manipulation uh, uh, package. You can pick observations by their values for uh, using filter. We can reorder the rows with a range. We can pick variables by their names if we use the command select. 
and we can create new variables with functions of existing variables via using mutate. And we can collapse many values down into single summaries via the function summarize. So let's do some, uh, some data uh, claiming. So let's filter out some missings for departure delay. And so that's the variable depth delay. And here we choose to make a new data set. And uh, the reason we want to do that is because it's usually good so we can reconstruct them so we don't overwrite our original uh, data. So let's clean some data. So we use filter. So we make a new, a new variable uh, a data frame, which is called flights no miss. And we use the filter command from dplyr to do that. And we use flights, which is the data frame name, depth underscore delay. And then we have the exclamation point for not and is. And then we uh, tell it it shouldn't be an A. Okay, so that's how we use the filter command. And so that it will have removed all the cases in which the departure delay was missing. So I've just shown you uh, a logical operation, which is uh, not, but you can also have and and or. So this is or, the symbol, and this is and. And so based on the Venn diagrams, you might have different situations where it can be X or Y, this is the Venn diagram representation. This is X or X Y. So this is the, uh, the where the cases where we would want uh, the unique parts which don't overlap. X and Y. That would be the middle part of this Venn, uh, Venn diagram. So have a look at uh, at uh, these Venn diagrams, and there might be cases in which you uh, want them to overlap or not overlap. So when filtering, you'll need to make sure that uh, you can, uh, so you can use greater than, smaller than, not equal, and equal. And it's important to have this, the second is there. So often you would just put one is, but it's something different than having two is exclamation marks. Now, now it's also the time to tell you something about floating point numbers. Floating point numbers are a problem. Computers cannot store an infinite number of digits, so often you will have something really trailing behind, and the computer will struggle to uh, store that data. So the square root of three is three, and that should actually be true, but it's false. But what happens here is this is a number with a large tail which the computer fails to store, and then when we ask it to evaluate this expression, it will say it's false. And so the reason is we have many, many numbers behind the decimal, and that's causing uh, for problems. There's another example. Again, from your high school maths, one divided by 98 times 98 should be one, yet the computer says it's false. And so the, that's because of, uh, of uh, intermediate storage and, uh, and rounding. So the computer first takes one and divides by 98, which is a number with a huge amount of decimals, and then tries to multiply by 98. And then due to rounding issues, those numbers don't line up. So the solution to that is to use uh, near. So if we use near, square root 3, uh, uh, the accent circumflex, or like uh, the, the cap, we have that, then it's true. The same here. So you can solve this type of problems with near. So bear in mind that uh, when you store numbers, they might have a large amount of decimals, and you might need the near command to make sure that they line up. Now let's do some uh, basic statistics. Let's look at the de uh, delays with departure using departure uh, delay, that's variable. We use the dollar sign to select a column from our data frame. And this is what it actually looks like. So if you want to calculate the average delay, we'll use mean flight, no miss, dollar sign, departure delay. And this tells us on average that the delay is around 12 minutes, 13 if we round upwards. You should uh, remember that the median is not the same as, uh, as the mean. And the median is actually negative here. So most flights, flights actually uh, leave a little bit early. So it's the 50th percentile value of the distribution. 
And so if you don't know what that is, you should go back to your stats book and have a look. But the mean and the median are not uh, the, the same uh, necessarily. We can have several measures of variation. So we know the mean uh, delay, but there might be quite a lot of uh, variation around it. You should recall the standard deviation as well as the standard error of the mean. This is how we calculate the standard deviation. It's just SD for standard deviation. And the standard deviation is 40 minutes in this case. You should recall that, uh, that you also have the variance. And the variance is basically taking the, uh, the square of, uh, of that 40. And so that's 1,600 uh, and 16 minutes. And we can also calculate the standard error of the mean. You should recall from the formula, there's no real shortcut here, is that it's the standard deviation divided by uh, the, the, the n, the sample size. So this should be the square root length flight of the partial delay. So that's a, just to, to tell it the number of rows. And then if we print it, the standard error of the mean is actually quite small. And that's in part because we have a large number of flights. So don't worry too much about this. This is just to tell it to use the, uh, the square root of, uh, of, uh, of n. You should also recall confidence intervals, and so the 95% confidence interval. So we can have the upper limit and the lower limit confidence interval. So we take the, uh, the mean, we take the standard error, which is the SE, which we just calculated. And this number should ring a bell because of our sets course. So 1.96. Is, uh, is uh, what corresponds to the 95% percentile of a set distribution. And this is how we get the uh, uh, upper limit and the lower limit of the confidence interval. Yes? So I have a look back at your stats books in case you don't recall what a Z score is and if you don't know where this number comes from or what a confidence interval is. So often we have a, a, a very brief summary, which is the five number summary. So it's the minimum, the first quartile, the median, or the third quartile, and the maximum. So this would be 25th percentile. This would be 75th percentile of the distribution. If we do that, we use the command five num, and this is the five number summary for flight, no miss, departure delay, minus 43, minus five, minus two, that's the median we saw earlier, 11, 1301. So the longest delay is 1300 minutes in our data set. We can also use a command uh, summary, which will print the mean, minimum, the first quartile, the median, the mean, the third quartile, and the maximum of, of that variable. You should also recall the uh, interquartile range. So it's basically Q3 minus Q1. So the 75th percentile minus 25th percentile. And it's basically a, another measure of variation. So we can ask what the interquartile range is via flights, no miss, departure delay, and then IQR. And this is, gives us the number 16. And you can do it by hand by subtracting the numbers you saw earlier, which are Q3 and Q1 from uh, this uh, type thing. So if we subtract 11 minus, minus uh, 5, that should give us 16. And it's 16. You should also recall uh, box plots. And this is a very, uh, very messy box plot. But this is what a box plot looks like. And that will print the most important summary. So it's using the uh, whiskers to determine the uh, the uh, the outliers or the extreme values. So it's 1.5, the interquartile range. So the EQR. If you don't know what a box plot is, I would suggest you go back to your statistics book and have a look. But this is a summary. You can see that this is the most extreme flight of 1300. So most flights don't have a lot of delay, but there's a long tail with some uh, some delays. Now. Another thing which we might be interested in is the, is the mode, which is the most common value in a, in, a, in a set. It's quite tricky to derive in, a, in, a, in R. So mode is the most common value. Uh, you can find out more looking at the MLV package, uh, looking at the MLV function. We, knew, we use a package for this with mode est, which is for 
mode estimation. Uh, you get some information about it, and you uh, can use MLV, flights no miss, depth delay. We put in some methods as to how to use it. You can read a lot more about the, uh, the methods used to, uh, to estimate the mode because sometimes you'll have a large number of uh, candidate numbers and you have to pick between them. Don't worry about that for now. Just copy this code to get the mode. And the most likely value of the mode is minus five. And you can have some measure of skewness. You can, uh, you can find out more about this uh, skewness if you click this web link. But it's basically how much uh, skew there is surrounding this, uh, this, uh, this measure. So find out more if you want to find out more. But if you want to find out the most common value in your set, it's minus five. And this is how you get it. So sometimes you uh, you need to install a package which is under development, and for that to work, you first have to install DevTools, and then uh, you have to call DevTools and find out a uh, package. So I'll just show you briefly how uh, SkimR works. So uh, SkimR is uh, a package which allows you to summarize variables, and we use require. I won't run you through steps of installing DevTools, but it's the same step you've done before, so install Dev tools, yeah. We do it like this, and then if you want to call it, you can use this type of command, and we get it from a type called GitHub. Now, after you've done that, you can uh, skim through a data set, and so we can use the skim r. Well, let's let's first call skim r. So require skimmer. So it's loading the required package. You should see it highlighted. Here. And now we can use that to look at a data set. So I'm going to look at the different data set here than the example. I'm going to look at uh, data height. So skim. data height. So, it will have uh, uh, printed some, uh, some uh, infra information and it gives us some, uh, some overview. So it gives us the mean, the standard deviation, the minimum, the 25% uh, quintile, and so on. And it also gives us uh, the number of missings, how many cases there are, the minimum, the maximum, how many unique there are. So lots of information you can get from uh, from Skimhart with long, one line of code. So it's basically a summary of all your uh, of all your variables. So have a go. This is what you uh, would get with the Skim flights data. So a table with all the information, and uh, play around with it. Have a look and see what you uh, what you find. You might say that you miss SPSS. Well, luckily for you, there is some uh, some bit of SPSS still left. You can use uh, our commander uh, to toy around with some things if you have to do things faster. So I'll just quickly show you how that works. Require our commander. And you will have seen that it will have popped up X quartz. So in a Mac, you need uh, X quartz, which you have to install. And this looks a lot like uh, like uh, SPSS, doesn't it? So you can uh, load data sets. You can get statistics via your pointy clicky methods. You can have models. Uh, you can do uh, all the things you're uh, used to doing, like uh, uh, ANOVA and uh, t-tests via our commander. So if you want to play around with this a little bit, it will also allow you to print the mark, uh, markdown report. So you can change those things, and it will generate a report. And it will show you the R code, which underneath, uh, uh, underlies it. So we can ask it to make 
a distribution with normal probabilities. We can call that Thomas. And we'll just click OK. And so P norm C Thomas mean is 0, SD is 1, lower dot tail is true. And now we'll have made a, 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 a normal distribution with these characteristics called Thomas. So you can play around with this to uh, to to uh, find out more. Currently, there's no data set attached, but you can load data into it, and then you can toy around with this a little bit more to find out how it works. If you miss SPSS a lot, we're going to exit it. We're not going to save the script, and we're not going to save the markdown. Okay, nearly at the end. So I would like you to do uh, an exercise, which is loading the flight's data set, calculate the mean delay and arrival for Delta Airlines. So only use uh, uh, Delta Airlines. So use the filter command to select only Delta Airlines. Calculate the associate 95% confidence interval, which we discussed. And I want you to do the same for United Airlines. And I want you to compare the two. Do their confidence intervals overlap, or is one significantly uh, slower or faster than the other one in terms of delay? I would like you to calculate the mode for the delay in our arrival for uh, JFK Airport. So again, use the filter command to find JFK Airport. And I would like you to calculate the modal delay using the uh, commands you saw before. So use this command, which you saw earlier, mode est. Use that package and use the MLV command to do that. And let's... Oh, too fast. And I would like you to save uh, a data set as .saf, but I want the data set to only be the departing flights from JFK Airport. And I would like you to submit all of that via the e-learning uh, portal. I can tell you a little bit about uh, Jupyter Notebooks. So uh, next to our studio, you should know that Jupyter Notebooks exists. And this would be especially handy if you need to combine Python with, uh, with R. My experience is that they are great, but they don't necessarily play well with multiple versions of R or network PCs. But if you're up for a challenge, you could try and install a Jupyter Notebook. So what's Jupyter Notebooks? So this is a Jupyter uh, uh, program, and it's basically a notebook where you can do computation. You can find out all the information here, and you can run a notebook server. So if you're up for a challenge, you can read all this information, and you can uh, run uh, run notebooks that way. All you have to know is that uh, they exist, that they are pretty cool, and if you want to find out more, you can read out more about writing a report in Jupyter Notebook. But for now, our studio should satisfy your needs. So these are some of the references I talked to you about. You might want to look at some of them. You want to perhaps look at some of the uh, uh, some of the. So this book is uh, free, and you might want to work your way through that. And some of the examples I've used are from this book. And for next week, I would like you to complete the exercises. I strongly recommend you reread these slides. Work through some of the references, toy around, have fun, look at our commander, look at your assignment. Even after the first lecture, you can already complete some parts, and uh, I hope you have uh, fun. And so there's further resources, and I hope you will engage, read some books, complete some courses, complete a tutorial, uh, and try to get most out of it. That's it for now. Best of luck.